uh, Sandia Labs. Uh, he did his BS uh, it, from Michigan Tech. That was in 1996. Then he moved to Berkeley to do his master's and PhD. And he finished his PhD in 2001, and then he joined uh, the Sandia National Labs. And, and since then, he has been there. Uh, his uh, research interest actually spans, uh, you know, in the in the in the area of mechanical behavior and performance of, of systems. In particularly, he has uh, he has been uh, looking into the microsystem reliability, nano indentation, fracture, fatigue, uh, weld metallurgy, uh, to just name a few. And in these areas, he has uh, published more than actually 160 papers. I'm so sure that this number is is an outdated number uh, because I was just looking at Google and I think that he has uh, he has easily exceeded numbers 300 or so. Uh, he has uh, got several awards uh, in his uh, distinguished career. Uh, just to name a few, uh, the one is Hearst Fellowship, and then uh, uh, J. Keith uh, Bry uh, Macombe uh, Medal, and. Uh, uh, he is also the president of the TMS right now. I think you just started your tenure this year, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, so he, uh, we met uh, uh, at at this ICF meeting at Atlanta, and and I had a privilege of listening to a very fantastic talk by him on the on the, on you know on the on the fatigue and 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 what happens in the initial stages of fatigue crack growth. And I think that later got published also in it just came out in Nature. And, right. and today uh, he will give a, a slightly uh, you know general talk uh, on the stabilized nanocrystalline alloys and how he built an indestructible indestructible terminator style sorry termi terminator style robot. So with that brief introduction, Brad, please continue your talk. Yeah, thank you. And this title I've yeah, certainly well. taken some liberties with. You'll see exactly why I picked this title. If you stick around to the very end, I'll explain. Right, before you continue, how, uh, yes. we are recording this. I hope that's okay with you. Sure, sure. Okay. Yes, if you stick around to the end, you'll find out exactly what I mean by how I built an indestructible Terminator style robot. Um, so thank you for that introduction. I'm Brad Boyce, I'm at Sandia National Labs, as you already heard. I'm also affiliated with a branch of Sandia that's called the Center for Integrated Nanotechnology. This is the small center that I reside in. It's about 30 staff members or so. Uh, it's a joint venture between Sandia and Na Los Alamos National Laboratories. And here we're a user facility, so we specialize in making measurements that are very difficult to make at the nanoscale or creating materials that are very difficult to create at the nanoscale. And with those unique capabilities, we invite users to come use our facilities uh, with us and uh, you know, make progress with nanotechnology. So my background, as you just heard, is in the mechanical behavior of materials, and I study that domain in a number of different applications. Uh, I came to Sandia because I was very interested in applying abilities to do mechanical testing at the micro scale in micro and nano devices and in thin films. The image that I show you on the left is an image from work we published now over a decade ago doing micro scale tensile testing. And what you see there looks like some chains or something. These are actually a string of individual tensile test platforms that are strung together so that when you pull on the chain, each tensile test proceeds in sequence, allowing you to do thousands of independent tensile tests in a matter of hours. And then the middle of, you know, I'm originally a metallurgist, so I'm always interested in structural metals and alloys uh, at the macro scale, but also the micro scale origins for fracture and fatigue. And so the uh, image that you see below that, the colorful image, that's uh, some of our recent work looking at the origins of ductile fracture here in a copper material, um, it, but we've been studying a number of different metals and alloys and looking at, in this case, the black zone that's got the arrow pointing at it in the very middle of the image. That's the nucleation of a void and uh, you can see the scale bar at the at the submicron, deeply submicron scale. This is the uh, the very start of ductile fracture at the earliest incipient stages uh, that you can see experimentally. 
And here we're using a, a transmission Kikuchi diffraction technique to map out the local crystallography associated with the formation of voids. And then on the right, a topic that's relatively new to me. I've only been working in it for about five years now, but uh, for that reason, perhaps it's very exciting to me, which is to understand the mechanical behavior of metamaterials and materials created via additive manufacturing. And here I show in blue and yellow is a meta material that we've invented. In fact, uh, I hold a patent on this. This is called an interpenetrating lattice. And when you try to transmit energy through this lattice, say from the yellow end to the blue end, all of the energy has to transmit from one surface to the other. So it becomes interface mediated. Uh, interesting thing from a fracture perspective, we've published actually a nice paper on the fracture of these structures, the R curve resistance curve behavior. And uh, because the two lattices, the yellow and blue lattices have different properties, they essentially contribute uniquely to the overall structural integrity of the composite. And I use that word composite intentionally because while this is colored here yellow, actually we print them all out of the same material. This is all printed out of a single material, yet it gives us composite-like toughening because the two sub lattices are architecturally distinct from one another and therefore have different mechanical properties. So when one starts to break, the other one takes over and you get some pretty profound toughening. What we find with that blue and yellow lattice is we can make it up to, in, in one case, six times tougher than the base material it's made out of. So again, that's a very, very typical in composites that you can achieve such types of gains. Uh, but now we've done it without actually varying the material. Instead, we're varying the architecture of the meta material. So these are all fun topics for me to tell, as you might be able, as you might notice, I get excited about these uh, and I'm not going to talk about any of them. So today we're going to switch to another gear. I just want to give you some flavor of some of the things I like to work on. Um, uh, I'll start this talk from the context of history. Uh, if you look at the history of engineering disasters over the centuries, uh, some of the most classic engineering disasters, in fact, many of them share a common thread, and that's that they or originate with deformation, fracture, and fatigue. And here I show you several different examples here. Of course, the Titanic being one of those most notorious failures, but ultimately controlled in part by fracture of the, um, the ship and associated with its impact with an iceberg and the temperatures of the water play a role as I think many of you understand and realize and so on and so forth. And you know another example in the top middle, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Of course, this isn't just a materials failure problem. This is a resonance, acoustic resonance because the, vibe, the, uh, the design of the bridge was such that the wind could excite a resonant mode and it started flailing about wildly as you see here. But once it started flailing about wildly, eventually the material gave up. And so it ultimately was a fracture and fatigue problem as well. And uh, many other examples that you see here. So it's our job to prevent that. And that's not just a historical problem. These problems continue to this day. Uh, they cost billions of dollars every year. And if you look at reports on uh, material failure, you see that many of material failures originate due to fatigue loading, cyclic loading. So this uh, has been reported a number of different times in aircraft, for example, 55% of all failures are associated with fatigue loading. It's the single most dominant failure mode and it far surpasses any other failure mode. So if we want to prevent engineering disasters in the future, perhaps our best investment is in fatigue failure. So I'm gonna, I'm sorry if this is overly simplistic, I will only spend a few seconds on it. Uh, I think this, this presentation was originally developed for uh, students who may not have a background in mechanical behavior of materials. So of course, for those of us that are specialists in the area, we know very well that uh, the most basic and rudimentary way we can think about fatigue resistance of a material is in the stress life or strain life curve, SN curve as we call it. Uh, 
Uh, and this is just a plot of the number of cycles to failure as a function of how aggressively we load the material. And uh, we know that this can be divided into several stages. Ultimately, there's the fracture of the material, but before the material fractures, the crack is propagating. And before that, the crack has to initiate. And in the, uh, the top region, what we call the low cycle fatigue region, life is dominated by crack propagation. So our biggest enemy to fight is resisting crack propagation. But down in the high cycle fatigue regime, the lower colored bar there, you see the red bar is the longest. The, lo the li lifetime is dominated by the process associated with how we initiate fatigue cracks in the first place. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about all of that today, but uh, primarily I'm going to be talking about how to prevent high cycle fatigue failure. And so to put some concrete numbers on that SN curve, I've here plotted some envelopes. These three colored envelopes are for three different alloy classes, uh, iron based alloys, you know, of course, steels and nickel based alloys and aluminum alloys. And in general, this is, you know, a rule of thumb. These colored zones are the regimes where the metal tends to operate. There aren't many exceptions to these bounds uh, that I'm familiar with. And so we have a problem here of white space. If an engineering designer wants a material that can survive, let's say 1.5 gigapascals of cyclic stress or maximum stress for a million cycles, there is no engineering commercially available ma uh, material for them. And so this prevents, this is essentially what limits the engineering design space. It's what creates the thickness of parts. Uh, it's what limits the efficiency of engines uh, in terms of their size or the efficiency of vehicles in general is the inability to design structures uh, to sustain higher loads. So I'm going to tell you a tale in four parts today. That was my introduction. Um, and I'm going to move rather quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, we're already 15 minutes in, so I'll keep on moving here. And I, I want to talk first about the promise of nanocrystalline metals. So we know that grain boundaries add strength to metals. This is the so-called hull pitch effect. And the simple plot I show you here is that the yield strength scales with the grain size raised to the minus one half power. Uh, for 35 years or more, we've understood that this law has a limit. If you go to grain sizes much below 100 nanometers, you start to saturate this process and uh, maybe even create a mechanistic transition that causes it to turn over. And this is thought to be associated with the fact that, you know, dislocation activity is what causes yielding at flows at, at large grain sizes. But as you shrink the grain size down below 100 nanometers, dislocation based deformation processes no longer dominate. And instead, a new deformation process kicks in, and that is grain boundary mediated, where you have grain boundary sliding or other types of grain boundary mediated processes instead of dislocation based processes. And so uh, for monotonic loading to yield, this is well known, like I say, for 35 years. I got interested in the question about 15 years ago. How does this translate into fatigue loading? So. Uh, we know that metals get stronger with nanocrystal grains. Of course, strength usually corresponds to fatigue resistance. So to, how does this mechanistic transition work out for fatigue resistance? So first start again, basic concepts that we understand the mechanism for fatigue crack initiation in traditional metals. It's associated with dislocation plasticity, of course, as well. But in particular, the formation of persistent slip bands, PSBs, and their associated formation of extrusions and intrusions that can lead to notch-like stress concentrations on the surface, which ultimately trigger the formation of a fatigue crack. So that's what we think we understand at a very basic level in coarse grain metals, but this has description entirely started with the idea of dislocation plasticity. And as I've already alluded, dislocation plasticity gets a little bit tricky when the grains are only tens of nanometers in size. So 
you know, just for reference, when we talk about nanocrystalline, usually we're referring to materials with grain size below 100 nanometers. But in most traditional metals, the grains are far larger, thousand times larger. And so a billion nanocrystalline grains would fit inside an ordinary microcrystalline grain from a regular aluminum alloy, let's say, or any tra traditional structural alloy. So these are unusual materials with tons of extra grains in them. And, and so what happens to the fatigue mechanism? The first investigation I had on this was comparing, looking at three different alloys that are nickel based, a uh, pure nickel, nickel manganese, and nickel iron. Each of these were uh, electro deposited. These happen to be all three uh, materials that have well established electroplating um, processes. But and they all give us something in the range of approximately nanocrystalline material, albeit with slightly different grain sizes. So if we take these and we fabricate them as thin films, a few microns thick, uh, we develop and then we and then we pattern the film into the shape of some mechanically testable structure. Uh, so we can use a process to do that shaping. Here we're using, a, a, at first we used what's called the LIGA process. It's a lithographic process that allows you to pattern electroplated metals into a particular shape. And uh, you can see we can shape it into a tensile bar, as you see in the lower right, or we can shape it into some odd shape here. This is a cantilever beam for uh, flexural bending. We can bend the ring back and forth and watch it fatigue. So once we have these small structures, we can think about how to put them into uh, custom test systems that are designed for small scale, not microscopic or miniature, but yeah, small scale compared to most conventional ASTM standards for sure, uh, and then perform high cycle fatigue tests. And when we do that, we can catch our SN curve. This comes after actually a few years of technique development and measurement, but now we can start to report the SN data for these new metals, uh, nickel manganese, nickel iron, and nickel in their nanocrystalline state. And the point I make here is that, you know, some of these metals, depending on their condition, are occupying the white space. Uh, we're seeing metals now that can sustain 1.5 gigapascals of peak stress over a million cycles. And there was something a little confusing to me about this first study. So uh, the grain size didn't seem to scale monotonically. The smallest grain material wasn't the most fatigue resistant, it seemed, and that was a little puzzling to me. So I dug into this a little deeper uh, that I'm summarizing about eight years worth of work <laughs> in a few sentences. Uh, what we did is we said, well, the problem here might be that we're not we're, we're not only changing the grain size, we're also challenging changing the alloy. And and so, of course, this is not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. We should be a bit more systematic about it next time. So we picked the nickel iron alloy and we intentionally varied its grain size across a range using both annealing and electroplating uh, tricks to vary the grain size. And now I can show you that same SN curve, but for a single alloy, the nickel iron alloy, and for, for average grain sizes ranging from 49 nanometers to 633 nanometers. And now you see a dramatic shift in the fatigue resistance. The larger grains, although albeit this is still not conventionally large grains, 600 nanometers is still quite small, but it has very low fatigue resistance in the SN space. Then as we decrease the grain size, we see the systematic trend towards increasing fatigue resistance. And by the time we get to 49 nanometers, we see the, the turquoise curve and the purplish curve up at the top are uh, have very impressive uh, fatigue resistance. Now I'm, I actually have changed the y-axis. I'm using the term stress amplitude instead of maximum stress. So forgive me for the change in in uh, in in the way we graph this. But um, nonetheless, what's also interesting is the turquoise curve seems to not necessarily be as strong as the purple curve. Uh, in fact, at the high cycle fatigue regime, it seems to be falling off in its fatigue resistance. So perhaps there's this question that once you get the grain sizes extremely small, perhaps there's some loss 
in fatigue resistance. And one of the ways we can plot that is to just grab the um, the endurance limit for each one of these curves. That is, when you fit the curve to it and you extract the value at 10 to the seventh cycles, what does it look like? So that's our next plot. So this is the curve at 10 to the seventh cycles. And you can see uh, the, the stress that causes the endurance limit is a function of grain size. Now here I've taken the liberty to raise the x-axis to that minus one half exponent. So that's the hull patch exponent. And you know, so approximately you see, if you squint, you see somewhat of a linear scaling uh, for the first four observations, the leftmost four observations, until you get to the smallest grain size, and then you can maybe see something of a saturation or a turnover or a mechanistic transition, especially in the context of what I already showed you for the hall patch breakdown in monotonic loading. So now we have a question here. What is happening in these smallest grained materials? So I'm a I'm a material scientist. I like to understand the mechanistic origins. And of course, fractography is one something that's important to all of us structural integrity folks. So let's look at the fracture surface and see what's going on in these materials. So we have these unusual fatigue specimens that I already explained to you. They're broken in half now. Uh, we can look at them in the microscope and try to interpret the fracture surface as is commonly done. We find some features that make us comfortable right away, like shear lips at the end for catastrophic fracture. From there, we know that's the end for where final fracture occurs, so we can trace back and we see several other things, things like river marks and so forth that might be somewhat familiar. But what was the most unusual to us was all the way back at the point of origin, where we often are looking for some sort of critical flaw that triggered the initiation process. Here I see some sort of strange feature and I put three red question marks in this uh, image. Um, what's going on here? This is a strange looking feature. In fact, I'll zoom in in the next image. There's an, another example. This is actually a different sample, but we see this every single time. When we look at the fracture surface, the zone of initiation has this very blocky looking surface. It looks almost crystallographic. And that's puzzling to us because we believe our starting grain size is only tens of nanometers. Like I say, 49 nanometers average grain size. And there in the lower right of this image, you see the four micrometer bar. So these blocky features are far larger than our starting grain size. It's funny, uh, it doesn't really seem to add up until we cross-sectioned into these blocky features and found something really unexpected. We found that underneath these blocky fracture surface features, the material itself was no longer nanocrystalline. While in the remainder of the fracture surface and underneath the material, the grains were very small. You see them as black and white dots in the left image. But right underneath these blocky crack initiation features, here in this ion channeling contrast image, you see these zones, they almost look like fingers that are relatively low contrast and they're quite bright, white and some light grays. I've got four green arrows pointing at them just to show off what I'm looking at here. These are large grains. They're measured in microns, not in 40 nanometer or tens of nanometers. And to confirm that beyond the electron or the ion channeling image, if you look on the right, this is now an electron backscatter diffraction image, again, mapping the crystallographic orientation. And we see that these large grains underneath the fracture initiation site are, are uh, particular orientation, 110, and they're the only grains that are large in the system. So somehow we have some large grains that are triggering crack initiation. And so now it led us to a, a speculation. We postulated based on everything we saw so far that the grains all started nanocrystalline. In fact, we had confirmed that through dissecting our samples uh, to, you know, after they're deposited. We never found any evidence that in the as deposited case we had any large grains. So we thought maybe, and this was sort of wild speculation at the time, maybe the fatigue loading itself was causing the grains to somehow grow. Uh, and then if the grains were growing, 
they became bigger and could support more dislocation activity. And as a with the ability to support more dislocation activity, perhaps then they could become more conventional and trigger traditional processes like persistent slip or something akin to persistent slip that could permit crack initiation. In other words, our postulate was nanocrystal metals don't initiate fatigue cracks themselves. They merely transition to a state where they're no longer nanocrystalline. And then the microcrystalline grains initiate fatigue cracks in a more traditional way. So the next step in our discussion here is to confirm this hypothesis, and that's part two. So we're going to confirm it in three different ways. We're going to confirm it with modeling, we're going to confirm it with synchrotron diffraction, and we're going to confirm it with transmission electron microscopy. And along the way, we're going to answer a few questions about this process. So I'll start with modeling. Here is an atomistic model using molecular dynamic simulations. Um, we're going to apply 20 cycles. We can't quite apply a million with atomistic modeling yet. Uh, actually, 20 is quite a lot. I don't think anybody's ever gone beyond 20. And in our study, we ended up going up to 200 cycles, which is definitely the most fatigue cycles ever applied in an atomistic simulation, unless uh, there's a paper out there that I haven't found on this. So you can see we set up the simulation to represent polycrystalline grains. The green regions are crystalline. The gray regions are grain boundary, um, and there are also a few twins and faults in the system as well. Uh, we could change the atom type. This one happens to be, uh, I believe this was platinum. I could be wrong here. We've we've studied a few with this approach, so forgive me. It's a, certainly an FCC metal. Uh, could be gold as well, but uh, you know each of the FCC metals more or less do something similar more or less uh you know the de the details are where the difference is but the the general phenomenon i'm going to show you is the same for all fcc metals so now what we're going to do is we're going to start fatigue loading this set of grains and the only thing we've told these molecular dynamic simulations is the forcing function between atoms so all they know is their proximity to the atoms around themselves each other and with that proximity they know how much force is being applied to that atom to push it around. We've given it no information about mechanics. Uh, of course, it's embedded in the forcing function. Things like stacking fold energy are something that we double check to make sure that these atomistic models can predict. The elastic constants, we don't actually explicitly give it the elastic constants, but that falls out of these types of simulations once you've set up those forcing functions correctly. And we certainly don't tell anything about fatigue mechanics. So what happens when we start to cycle this? What we see over these 20 cycles is a set of evolutions that cause the grains to grow. So you see in the middle, this very large grain that emerges as a result of applying 20 fatigue cycles. So this already confirmed a hypothesis we had, the possibility that fatigue loading could actually cause grain growth. And that was exciting to me because if you read a textbook about fatigue, you'll be hard pressed to find any words about grain growth. And if you read a textbook on grain boundaries, which there are several, or grain microstructures, you'll be hard pressed to find a comment that suggests that fatigue might cause these types of evolution, grain boundary migration and grain growth. Normally, we think when with metals, to make the grains bigger, we have to anneal them. We have to apply temperature, not cyclic loading. And uh, here we showed that this fatigue-based grain growth process uh, can accelerate grains faster than annealing alone. So in fact, actually, when you superimpose temperature plus fatigue loading, that's when you can grow the grains the fastest. Uh, there's more in the in the paper that I cite down below. So, you know, here's some still images of that same idea from a different simulation showing again, starting with uniform equiax nanocrystalline grains. And it, as we got out to 200 cycles in this case, you see the gray grain bound grain emerge. And here we've colored by the number of grains, number of atoms in that grain on a logarithmic scale. And uh, so this was pretty 
this is pretty beneficial to me, although we can't quite model crack initiation because we can only go out to 200 cycles, and so it's pretty artificial, but um, still gave us some confidence that we're on the right track. So the next experiment is X-ray diffraction. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this pretty quickly, but I want to share kind of cool insight that came out of it. So we went to the synchrotron where we could get very intense X-rays because we want to characterize this material while we're fatiguing it, and we don't want to wait too long for the signal to come in. So we set ourselves up for a condition where we have a broad energy range. So that's what we call a white light uh, X-ray beam. That gives us a situation where we get Bragg diffraction and we use an area detector uh, to detect the entire Bragg ring or the cone of diffraction that comes off the sample as I illustrate here. Uh, this is because the X-ray beam, uh, although it's somewhat small in size in the 100 micron range, is far larger than the grain size. So the X-rays are sampling oodles and oodles of grains, perhaps on the order of you know, 100 million grains. So we get this powder diffraction pattern, so to speak, in a solid piece of material. And as a result, we get the diffraction rings uh, like the ring that I show you here. What we were, what we, after several years, again, sort of skipping through years of work, <laughs> we realized uh, if the fatigue loading was just triggering one or a few grains to grow, uh, they wouldn't change the average grain size, but we would see signs of anomalously large grains or crystallites in the sea of small grains. So what we thought we should see, the ring itself that I show you here in blue, is the representation of hundreds of millions or billions of very small grains, uniformly sized. But if we have a very large crystallite formed by fatigue, it should cause one particular orientation to pop up on this ring. And so uh, after we thought about that a bit, we, we started searching through our rings and we found these little hot spots on our ring. And boy, you would originally say that's just statistical scatter, uh, but we went to great lengths to prove that this little red hot spot here is not statistically expectable. In fact, with six sigma confidence we can show that that red spot doesn't belong to the rest of the ring and is an indication of an anomalously large grain present in an otherwise a sea of very fine grains so we can track that anomalous intense spike with fatigue loading and that's what i show you here the intensity of the spike is on the y-axis and the number of cycles is on the x praveen i see you've jumped in is there a problem No, no, it's all right, please. All right, uh, I'll keep on going. Yeah, but, Go ahead. Yeah, please yeah. All right, so we see dramatic grain growth and the intensity of this, this peak changes with fatigue cycles. We were used this not only to track the grain growth process non-destructively, but also to catch the stage at which we thought that the fatigue crack might start forming and skipping a lot of information, we see that this not only matches up with modeling from the 80s, but we could find fatigue cracks forming right there. Uh, in fact, so this is pretty awesome that we were able to use this non-destructive technique to trap a crack that was forming at the nanometer scale. So now we've, we've caught a crack in the action of forming. Uh, the last confirmation is in the transmission electron microscope. And uh, here, we're doing cyclic loading while looking through the material. We have to make these very small tensile bars. They're only a micron or so long, and they're only 40 nanometers thick. But when we do that, we can see each and every grain and what's going on inside of it. So we get videos like this. Here we've got this white crack, and you see contrast changes. We're loading the sample up, and then we're going to start fatiguing it. Now it gets blurry because we're fatiguing the sample. Uh, we're one of the few places in the world that can apply this sort of fatigue loading on uh, these sorts of samples. But at the crack tip, the white zone, you see the microstructure evolving. Uh, what you see is the crack is getting longer, the white is growing, and the gray region is getting bigger. So 
that's again evidence for us of the idea that the fatigue is not only causing cracking but associated with that cracking we're seeing grain growth so that was nice confirmation for us again years of work to make that observation and here is another example in stills where we have a fatigue notch and we're applying 180,000 cycles and we see some microstructural evolution but after 840,000 cycles, we see the grain has grown very large, which I've outlined in green. And the coolest thing, that little white zone right there is a fatigue crack forming. Now that fatigue crack is only tens of nanometers in size. So one of the smallest fatigue cracks ever observed in nature. Uh, so that was very cool uh, to see the grain growth process and then also the associated crack initiation process. So uh because i know time is limited i want to just keep on moving quite quickly here through this next topic which is how we stabilize the nanocrystalline metals we know that they're now susceptible to this grain growth process uh but how do we uh prevent that so we know that grain boundaries move they have a velocity with them and that velocity can be thought of as the product of two terms M is the mobility of the grain boundary, how easily it moves. P is the driving force, how hard we're pushing it. And uh, the first, the mo mobility term is essentially controlling the kinetics of the process, that is limp throttling the speed. And the driving force is affecting the thermodynamics of the process, that is uh, how hard we're pushing the gas pedal. So, this is a very simple equation. It's a nice way to think about things at the highest level. But when we want to start to think about stabilizing the grain boundary, we can think about modifying both the mobility and the driving force, the kinetics and the thermodynamics. And to track these approaches, we can use or, or to to uh, modify these parameters, we can use several different technology or approaches. Uh, metallurgists have for a long time used kinetic modifiers. They'll add a solute content to the material to induce either zener pinning or solute drag, which are both kinetic modifiers. They slow the grain boundary down. Uh, and then more recently, in the last 10 years or so, there's also been an interest in adding solute, but more from the thermodynamic perspective of solute that will lower the free energy of the grain boundary. And so it will uh, make the grain boundary less costly thermodynamically. So there's less of a motivation for the grain boundary to move in the first place. And uh, all of these are relevant. Uh, but what we did is we, through some modeling, we've set up a uh, phase field model that can predict all of these effects simultaneously using uh, as we add solute to a system. So there's you know, equations I'm not going to go to into behind phase field modeling. This allows us to um, track both the kinetics and, and thermodynamics of microstructural evolution. And we can take a microstructure here, a kind of toy microstructure and watch it evolve. And what we see in the orange regions, we see elements that have segregated to the grain boundaries. And in the red regions, we see precipitates and we can watch their contributions to the overall kinetics of microstructural evolution and show that certain solute choices allow us to stabilize the grain boundaries. That led us to one particular system. Uh, it's the addition of gold into gold solute into pure platinum. It's not exactly technologically relevant, but it's scientifically interesting. And actually, there might be some technological relevance with regard to electrical contact alloys. Um, there's actually some pretty useful technological applications for this, even though it's a very expensive alloy to make. And what we what we see here on the left in this energy dispersive map is the platinum with gold it containing in it. The gold itself resides on the grain boundaries and they decorate the grain boundaries. They light them up, as you see here. The green read, the green traces here are high concentrations of gold at the grain boundaries. And we can plot that in, you know, a trace in the right. So we have this special case in the platinum gold system. Not all alloys will do this, of course, but in this special case, 
Gold will naturally segregate to the grain boundary. It will lower the free energy of the grain boundary, providing both a thermodynamic and a kinetic trap for that grain boundary. We have this beautiful image here of gold sitting at the grain boundaries if you want to think about this at the atomistic scale. And so we can simulate this through the phase field model I showed you before. We can also simulate it through atomistic models like this. And we've studied in deep and gory details the metallurgy behind this, the role of the grain boundary character. So that is the configuration of atoms at the grain boundary, all sorts of other gory details on the metallurgy uh, that's going on here that I'm, I'm glossing over entirely here. Uh, but I'll say that, you know, first of all, we check, does the gold stabilize the grains? And sure enough, when you heat platinum gold up, it's far more stable than pure platinum. So in fact, one day at 500 C with pure platinum gives you far more grain growth than one week at 500 C with the gold stabilized alloy. So this is, you know, expected after all the modeling that we did, but conf confirmed through experiments. Now, how does it perform in fatigue loading? Here's our SN curve again, and uh, now we're looking at the stress amplitude as a function of number of cycles. The green data points are the pure platinum, our reference case, and the red data points are the platinum gold where we stabilize the green boundary. And as we had hoped, by adding a little bit of green boundary stabilizer to the nanocrystal metal, we're able to improve its resistance to grain growth, a phenomenon that was never formally is, uh, associated with fatigue. And by increasing the resistance to grain growth, we're able to stabilize the grain boundaries and improve the resistance to crack initiation and extend the fatigue life. Uh, this is sort of confirmed in a lot more detail than I'm explaining here in the paper that is shown below. But remarkably, we've improved the endurance limit by 75% through a simple metallurgical trick. And while in this particular case, we need gold for that trick, which is a very expensive element, we can imagine this for many other binary alloy systems that don't use nearly as expensive as solute. So this is a new, new approach to fatigue enhancement in an alloy class that can benefit from a strange uh, uh, metallurgical uh, trick. And this is some more of the confirmation that you find in that paper. On the left, you see the very large grains that form under fatigue loading in platinum. Uh, and on the right, when we stabilize the grain boundaries, even though we can cause fatigue, we can't quite cause as much grain growth. We see a bit of grain growth, but not nearly as much as we did in the pure platinum case. And uh, you know, I'm going to skip over some of the videos. Uh, maybe I'll just show one video, real fun, real quick here. You know, we like to watch the fatigue crack growth process in situ in an SEM. Uh, another Herculean experiment here to watch the crack form and slowly propagate at the mouth of the crack, and then eventually tear open the material. Very tricky experiments. I will say, I'm going to make one more quick comment that this material is not just resistant to fatigue. We also have great wear resistance. In fact, this is the most wear resistant metallic alloy ever reported. Orders of magnitude more wear resistant than coarse grain metals. So it could have profound uh, utility as a uh, wear resistant material as well. And this actually has everything to do with the stabilization of the grain boundaries as well. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details here. In fact, I'm going to gloss over this. Somebody wants to ask a question about why these materials are wear resistant. I'm happy to share this slide in more detail. But you can read some of these things in a summary article. It's a relatively short four page, five page article that I wrote with some co-authors there on fatigue and fracture of nanostructured metals and alloys. So I think I have 13 minutes left. Praveen. And with that, I want to get to the part that I think is the most interesting. <laughs> the bonus round. Uh, since, I will... uh, since, since we have started a little late, uh, you can take uh, a, a few extra minutes. Should not be a problem. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I know I appreciate your patience. This is a lot to get through and I'm really plowing through a lot of content fast. I hope you're not completely lost. But if you are, I hope that I'll be able to pull you back in now because I think it's about to get quite interesting. Uh, and that's how I built an indestructible Terminator style robot. This is part four and the final part. <laughs>
So we're coming back to the TEM now. I showed you before we have this specialized way to do fatigue testing in the TEM. In fact, we worked with the manufacturer then called Hyzotron, now, now called Brooker, to, do, to modify their uh, nano indentation system so that it can do high cycle fatigue testing at 200 hertz to allow us to observe behavior, fatigue behavior in the TEM. Uh, I think they've only sold a couple of these so far. They're quite expensive, so uh, and the experiments are extremely difficult uh, even after you have the instrument because <laughs> you have to uh, manufacture the material at 40 nanometer thickness, and then you have to magically or with through a lot of effort of some very uh, focused individuals, you have to get that material that's 40 nanometers thick landed onto a silicon device that you see here on the lower left. We call it the push to pull device. It allows you to use the nano indenter and pushing on the hemispherical end. You can load the tensile bar in tension and uh, that helps you resolve issues with alignment and so on and so forth, but still a lot of uh, pain in these experiments. But once you get there, you can start to apply very precise loads. You see this plot in red here in the middle of the of the slide. That's the indenter load in micronewtons. I don't know. Most people don't think in the term of micronewtons. You can start to think of a micronewton as the weight of a mosquito's leg. So we're applying the mosquito leg forces and releasing them hundreds of times every second. 200 hertz fatigue is also quite impressive for those of you who do fatigue loading. Unless you do ultrasonic fatigue, that's a pretty fast fatigue test. And then um, you know we're, we're able to control the load ratio and all of the things, all the parameters you would normally want to control in a fatigue test, we can control them here at the micro to nano scale. And then we can observe the dis changes in displacement as you might want to do in a fatigue test as well. So lots of great results here in terms of our quantitative control over these experiments. But simultaneous with that quantitative control is the ability to watch what's happening. And so we can see through the material, we can see its nanocrystalline grains. The contrast is pretty complex here because it is nanocrystalline. There's a lot of distortion in the crystallography. And so you get a lot of contrast. And uh, but here we have a fib machined 80 nanometer notch where we can try to initiate a fatigue crack. And um, here we're at 80,000 cycles. You can see the crack initiation process. Again, this is, I believe, actually the smallest fatigue crack we've ever seen, about five nanometers in length. So what is that? About 50 atoms involved in that fatigue crack <laughs> in its length direction. And then uh, after that, we start to see some. Uh, some more crack initiation, crack growth early on in this experiment. I show you the crystallographic orientation of the grains that we can map through TKD. So now we're really studying the details of crack propagation down at the nanometer scale. And we're watching cracks migrate or propagate through individual grains and, and grain boundaries. And uh, of course, controlling the loads all the while. Now, some of the images are very crisp and clear, and those are because we've paused the fatigue test and taken a snapshot. But when we're actually doing the fatigue testing, the, um, the fatigue is faster than the imaging or the, the camera. And so the camera is really only able to record blur, a bit of a blur envelope. And so that's what you're going to see next is you're going to see some quasi static loading followed by some fatigue loading. So at first the image is rather sharp and then it gets blurry. The white zone is what I want you to focus on. It looks a little bit like a dog, perhaps at, at the if you look, it looks like a dog looking to the left. I don't know. Maybe you think it looks like something else, but look at the left most portion of that white crack. It just got longer and it's continuing to get longer. And there we pause. I'm going to play that one more time. So what we're really looking at is the leftmost portion of the white crack. Uh, it starts out shorter. It loads up. You see the shape of this white zone. Uh, and then you see that leftmost portion, the tip of the fatigue crack growing. That's what we were expecting to see. We wanted to watch cracks propagate through the material. And then we have to pause to see exactly the details of what's going on. But the next segment of video is what we didn't expect. I'll let that play one more time just so you see it. The white zone, the white crack getting longer down at the nanometer scale, you know, breaking a few atoms at a time. <laughs> 
as we're playing. Now this this video has been sped up. That was about 12 times faster than we actually recorded it. So that was about after the speed up. That was about 2400 Hertz fatigue loading pretty fast. Uh, so there was a total of 40,000 fatigue cycles that you just watched. Now if we watch the next 40,000 fatigue cycles after the crack has grown to that state, let's watch the next 40,000. So there it starts long again. There's that white crack, but watch what happens next. Watch that white crack. Uh, it's the contrast has changed where it's kind of blurry, but I can't quite tell where it is anymore until we pause. Now that crack that was long, as you see on the left, is appears to be much shorter, as you see on the right. That's the part that shocked me when I first saw it, and I said, I don't think anybody's ever predicted that will happen. That's what appears to be crack healing. Uh, and so I thought that was pretty fascinating, at least at the nanoscale. Of course, no, nobody's really had the power to be able to look at this length scale before, so maybe it's just something that's been missed in the past. And here's some still images where we nail down the details. I'll say one thing that was really interesting to me is um, you see the crack healing process, but after the crack is healed, the crack eventually grows off in a different direction than it was previously growing. So the crack was propagating in one direction, it heals, and then it propagates in a different direction. That again was a nail in the coffin that healing had actually occurred. And uh, here are some still images and some of the blur images. In fact, if you just focus on sub panels D to E, you can see that that point in time or the cycles over which the crack seemed to heal or close. And there's a terminology here that we started debating. The term closure, closing, that could be misleading here because of course for decades, we've used the term crack closure to refer to crack flanks that are coming in contact with each other. That's what I show you here. So, uh, this is a well-established term. In fact, uh, my advisor, Rob Ritchie, he, he was part of the people that really advocated for understanding the implications of crack closure. But crack closure is not healing. Crack closure is just crack flank contact that changes the stress state ahead of the crack tip. Now we're talking about not closure, but actual healing. And in fact, perhaps healing induced by closure. So perhaps at the nanoscale, the crack flanks come into contact, but because it's at the nanoscale, they're actually able to heal, not just close. There are, and that the distinction is in the healing, you can reform metallurgical bonds. And the other distinction is if you've only closed the crack but not healed it, it will reopen when you reload intention. Whereas this crack did not reopen. In fact, the crack eventually went to a different direction. Now, crack healing, we've heard about crack healing in other domains. In fact, actually, uh, crack healing is often uh, reported associated with uh, what I think of as some, some very clever trickery where you add a latent second phase that can fill in the crack uh, after heating or something like that. There are several ways that you can induce crack healing through material modification, but we made no material modification here. This is pure platinum. And so this is just native metals already having the ability to heal. And that's what I think was profound about our observation. Um, so here, just pl plotting the crack length as a function of number of cycles. And we note that the crack healing process is associated with a negative crack growth rate. And that is DADN, the crack growth rate that we often like to plot, was a negative value for a short period of time. And I point that out because the graph on the right, this is the platinum, nanocrystal and platinum. It was reported previously by my colleague, Chris Molstein. This is the DADN curve for this, or several curves under different conditions reported by a few different people. Uh, perhaps there's some debate about the exact details of these curves. That's neither here nor there. I can't put my data points on this curve at all because I want to report negative crack growth rates, and we aren't even plotting in a, war, in, a, in a realm that allows that observation. So the observation I've just made of a negative crack growth rate is disallowed by the fundamental ways that we choose to plot fatigue. That shows how fundamental this is 
in 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 our um, thinking. So, uh, you know, give credit to Chris Barr. I mentioned how tedious these experiments are. Chris was the one who tediously ran that experiment that I just showed you and showed me those results, but he wasn't the only one. When Chris first showed it to me, I said, this is a bit like citing Sasquatch. Nobody's going to believe us that cracks heal on their own. We need confirmation. I said, Chris, your predecessor, Chris was not the first person to run these tedious experiments. He had a predecessor named Dan Bufford. And I said, why hasn't Dan told us about crack healing? Chris, you're saying that the cracks heal, but Dan never mentioned that. So we called Dan Bufford up and we said, Dan, Chris has got these crazy observations of the cracks getting shorter during fatigue loading. Dan said, oh yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I just didn't know what to make of it, so I never showed you guys. <laughs> so uh, it turns out Dan was working in a different metal system. Uh, Chris's observations were in platinum. Dan had been working in copper. And uh, here's an example from one of Dan's observations. Uh, particularly look between the middle panel and the lowest panel. You see in the middle panel, the crack is starting to propagate towards the lower left corner. The nose of the crack is pointing down into the lower left. And then in the very next panel, that segment of the crack has disappeared. And now the crack is propagating towards the upper right. I mean, upper left. So, uh, you know, here again, this is the type of stuff. It, these are not long segments of the crack. This is just tens of nanometers of the crack that appear to form and then heal and then reform in a new direction. So that's the part that we got excited about. Uh, you know, I, then we had to make a third observation because if you've seen it twice, you got to see it a third time. And so this is yeah, the third guy. So it was even a different operator because by this point in time in our study, both Dan and Chris had moved on to greater pastures. And so uh, we hired Zach Milne and we said, well, Dan and Chris could see it. Let's see if you can make it happen. And here's the still images from his observation as well. Again, lots of details here but ultimately confirming that the crack gets longer, then shorter, then longer again. And we think this is all happening via a cold welding process, which has been observed many times at the nanoscale before. Here I show you some examples where other people have induced cold welding. Uh, now, not by fatigue loading and not in polycrystalline metals. These are in other contrived scenarios like pushing two gold nano dumbbells against each other and the associated crack will shorten with time uh, by a process that they attribute to cold welding uh, or shoving two gold nano rods together and watching the, the material heal itself in some sense. So that I cite a four articles here. I think you could probably find a few others as well. So the idea of cold welding at the nanoscale is not new, but what we're adding to it is that ordinary polycrystalline pure metals under fatigue loading can also do this. And it turns out it can be simulated. So actually, this atomistic simulation came from 2013, 10 years before we published our observations. And um, what they suggested was actually the healing process in cracks could be associated with grain boundary migration. So now I bring it all the way back full circle to the idea that in these metals, the grain boundaries migrate and what Mike Demkovitz and his co-author suggested in 2013 is when the grain boundaries migrate, they can change the local strain configuration and shove the crack flanks closed. So even if you're not as applying any macroscopic loading condition that induces crack flank contact, the boundary migration process alone could induce crack flank contact. This was a toy problem that he set up in a purely simulation based paper in 2013. He had no experimental confirmation of this. It was a theory uh, or a simulated idea that boundary migration could cause cracks to heal. But now we have our experimental observation. This was our experimental configuration. We sent him the exact experimental configuration and he created his own atomistic model of that configuration. So it consisted of these three grains, grain two, three, and four, and the triple junction as well as the actual type of grain boundary that we wanted to create. So this is basically recreating the local zone around where we had observed the healing process. 
and he's able to load it. He can't, in the atomistic simulations, as I've already explained, he can't apply hundreds of thousands of cycles. So instead, he just loaded it monotonically to see if even under monotonic large loading, so if you pull it long enough, will you get these types of grain boundary migration processes? And what you see there in the red zone is this, this twin boundary here the between grains three and grain four, that twin boundary does indeed migrate a few atoms. And when it migrates a few atoms, he predicts a local stress state that will cause the crack to close. And in fact, in this video here of that configuration, if we insert a crack, the crack is shown in gold here uh, into the simulation near the, the triple junction. And that, that crack, as we load it up, the crack will slowly disappear. And that's because the material is healing in that regime. And then there's a twin boundary that shows afterwards. But um, yeah, so this is a sort of a confirmation from modeling perspective that this is plausible, that grain boundary migration is responsible for the crack flint contact that induces cold welding. And sure enough, when we look back at our observations, we find a twin that twin boundary did actually migrate by a few nanometers. I think we've lost him. Yeah, it looks like. I think the internet is a problem. I don't know whether it's. This is my right at our internet. End. Uh, oh, it's right at our end. Most probably at his end, maybe he's uh, having trouble. Yeah, there's no issue. Internet. No issue at our end. I think uh, some issue. Uh, yeah, let's, 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 give it, yeah. let's, let's give it a yeah. few seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Praveen, if you have a way of sending a message on WhatsApp or something, that would help. Unfortunately, I don't have his number, I think he's logged off and is trying to rejoin. Rejoin. Uh, yes. So I will let me send him an email then. Ah, oh, he's back. Ah, he's back. He's back. Sorry, we just lost you for a for a for a. Yeah, for a, I see. I saw, I saw, sorry, something happened with the Wi-Fi, a little blip. Hopefully it won't happen again. Let me share my screen and, and get back to where we were. We're almost done. So if you're losing, <laughs> uh, if you're losing energy, I know it's almost 7 p uh, what, yeah, it's over past 7 p.m. there perhaps. That's getting a little late. Uh, I'm almost done. So can you see my screen again? Yep. Yep. So yep. we, we were just talking about this healing process that can be simulated as well and associated with grain boundary migration. I'm getting it in details. Uh, oops, is this even the right? Yeah, yeah, this is it. Um, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this. Let me just say there are some pretty important implications here for, for example, the role of atmosphere. Now, these experiments were in a TEM, so we didn't have a lot of oxygen around. And this may explain why you see improved fatigue resistance in oxygen-free environments. Perhaps the oxygen itself impedes this healing process by coating the surfaces and preventing the cold welding process. You know, these are sort of speculative, but I'm just showing you examples of results from other people that have emphasized how important oxygen is in fatigue crack growth and uh, and fatigue threshold behavior. Um, the, the existence of a fatigue threshold itself may also be explainable by the existence of cold welding or healing. In fact, actually, uh, my colleague Mike Demkovitz established a bit of a model that, that showed the, the threshold itself can be predicted by this healing. 
process and I'm skipping over some details here. Forgive me, we can discuss this at more length, but here again, the, there's an example of fatigue loading and how it's affected by ultra high vacuum or the presence of oxygen. So uh, I thought there was an interesting paper by Oguma and Nakamura who were, were studying fatigue behavior, uh, I believe in a steel alloy in vacuum. And they, in their discussion section, drew this schematic. Now there was some grain refinement in their case, but they also said that the repeating contacts in vacuum might cause some cold, you see the word cold welding and rebonding. So this was in 2013, 10 years before our observations again. It was merely a schematic, it was pretty much speculative, but they were already starting to think that maybe in vacuum, fatigue cracks might be able to cold weld themselves. So. Uh, I think again, putting two and two together, we realized that this there was some evidence ahead of time that could have caused us to expect this. And you know, as I say, we have a fatigue model for this. I'm skipping over it quickly. Uh, we can the curve on the left, the blue curve that shows a threshold. That threshold is predicted from a model that merely describes the crack healing process. Now, uh, so I'm going to wrap up here. As as Praveen mentioned, we published this in Nature last month. I'm very excited for ordinary metal fatigue to be a topic in Nature because ordinary metal fatigue is rarely published in a place like Nature. So uh, there's a lot of work to get this published. Uh, excited to get it get it out there. It's actually several years in the making, of course, uh, but it's led to quite a bit of notoriety, both good and bad. Um, there's been over 500 news agencies that have covered this topic. I pull a few examples here, but there are, yeah, as I say, 500 different titles of, of some author's interpretation of what we've done here. These three titles that I pull out here, I, I'm pretty fond of. I like these titles. But then there are a few titles that people have, you know, uh, media sensationalists, perhaps, authors who wanted to sensationalize this, and they said, uh, one third said, scientists discover how to build a Terminator style self-healing metal. And boy, is that quite an extension from what I've just shown you. <laughs> and then another author said, indestructible Terminator style killer robots move one step closer to reality as scientists discover self-healing metals. So <laughs> I think they've taken it a bit too far. I'm a little sad with that because I don't want to sensationalize what's already really cool science in the first place. Um, but I guess that's their decision and I can't control the media and how they choose to spin things. And they, you know, they generated all these. What's interesting, the two images on the left are images that we provided to the media for this topic, what we wanted them to display and what they chose to display were all the other images that I show you here. <laughs> like that's how they're going to show the results of our scientific effort is uh, with these sorts of images. I can't control the media. It's been fascinating ride for the last four weeks to watch what pops up. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with reporters on this, interviews with reporters and so forth. So um, I, I apologize if this embarrasses the field. <laughs> I didn't I didn't intend that, uh, but at least we're we're getting attention placed on topics like fatigue behavior and metals. Uh, at least the the general public's getting interested in these topics. So that's a good thing in my book. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. And now, uh, you know, I've stopped on the hour, so we're happy to stick around for conversation. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Brad, and thanks really for clarifying the 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 the, the title. <laughs> so, so now we understand that. So there are uh, several questions. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can start uh, with uh, with the first one, and I think these are chronicles. So, so uh, the first question is basically on your first part of the talk. Uh, uh, this is question from Nilesh, uh, Nilesh Badwe, who is in IIT Kanpur, uh, and uh, he, he, you know, he is asking about. That on your SN curve, where you are showing the effect of, uh, you know, the grain size, the nanocrystalline materials, uh, you you went down to about 49 nanometers. You didn't really show the results of 25 nanometers. Yeah. Right. So uh, 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 that's that's what. Yeah. 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 So that's Brad, right. You're, he was paying attention. Yeah. I can see that. That's right. I follow you the question. Previous slide. So that's why I asked. 
you had 25 nanometer data on the previous yeah. slide. That's why I asked him. Yes, that's right. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And that's only because I, when we went to go do the more systematic study, the conditions that we had for electroplating were only able to get down to 49 nanometers. So we didn't want to mix observations from two separate batches or, or studies with actually, in fact, we also changed the sample configuration. So in the first study where we app, where our deposition capability was allowing us to get down to 25 nanometers, uh, that was a cantilever beam and bending, which is what part of the reason why I use the maximum stress on those plots. But in this follow up study where I systematically in nickel iron varied the grain size, we were instead making the tensile bars, not the cantilever beam. We were using a different electroplating team and their electroplating recipe only allowed them to get down to 49 nanometers. So we, yeah, I wish we would have gotten down to 25 because I think we would have seen the trend even more definitively, uh, but we took what we got. And then the next couple of questions are uh, about your uh, grain growth model uh, or grain growth, growth observation during the fatigue. I, I, I assume that uh, the grain grew both during the nucleation and the growth phase, or was it only, uh, only confined to the grain growth part? Uh, sorry, the uh, crack growth part. Ah, uh, uh, OK, so this is a good question uh, that I didn't elaborate on, so I appreciate you also noticing that I didn't explain that much. So the grain growth process, based on a lot of observations that I didn't show you today, the conditions where we're studying grain growth are high cycle fatigue conditions. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of cycles, and so a vast majority of the life is spent in crack initiation, well, before crack initiation. Uh, Vikram, uh, did we lose him again, or this is my issue? No, no, no like we've we... lost him. Oh, OK. So what I will do next is that uh, I will ask, uh, uh, you know, I have requested Bharti to enable uh, Mike to the people who have asked questions. Or written the question, so maybe you can directly ask the questions to uh, Brad and have some discussion. Either that or uh, Pravin, perhaps you can just mail the chat to him and he can respond. Oh, he can he can see the chat. So, uh, yeah. to have Only a when better, he, when a he to, Yeah. Hello, yeah, I'm course. back. Great. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Oh, I guess I'm not anymore. Let me. I'm going to just turn off my camera if, just to make sure that we take as sure, little sure. bandwidth I, as I, possible. I, I will also do the same. So yeah. Sure. Sorry about that. So uh, as I was explaining, uh, most of our focus on grain growth has been the large grains that form before crack initiation. But once the crack initiates, especially around the crack, you can continue to observe grain growth. Um, so yeah, to the the short answer is yes, grain growth occurs both before and after crack initiation. But our studies have been focused on the grain growth that occurs before crack initiation. Sure. So now uh, I think Vikram has a couple of questions. Uh, Vikram, would you like to uh, uh, go ahead? Oh, okay, I'll I'll just read it. Up. What is the driving force for boundary migration? Yeah. Uh, Initially, when there is no there's no crack, you just have a maybe a free surface. If the response of the material is basically elastic, I mean, are these are these some sort of talks that develop on the boundary and lead to grain rotations and things? Yes, uh, because of elastic uh, mismatch between a I don't know a boundary region and a grain region or something like that. Yeah. So there are several different theories about the mechanistic process that is associated with the grain boundary migration and hence the driving force for migration. Uh, let me just describe the two, what I would think the two leading theories are. Uh, first theory, as you describe, is driving force. You could think of the elastic mismatch, as you said, the uh, one grain is stiffer than the other, and so the elastic strain energy of one grain is higher than the other. So there's an energetic advantage for the grain to migrate into the more compliant grain where there's less strain energy. 
that mm -hmm. certainly is a viable explanation and uh where um you know some people i think think that's the leading explanation i actually suspect that's a secondary contributor i don't discount it i i suspect it's a minor contributor i think the primary contributor is a different picture so if you imagine the, the easiest way to start this thought on the mechanism is to start with a low angle grain boundary if you have a few degree grain boundary you can think of it as a stack of edge dislocations so edge dislocations of course we are very comfortable with the idea that edge dislocations couple to stress and move so if by virtue of this low angle grain boundary being a stack of edge dislocations it couples to the stress and the stress drives the grain boundary to move now it's purely a mechanical explanation for grain boundary migration uh and it has to do with the plus essentially the plastic behavior of the grain boundary not the elastic behavior of the grains um now the description i just said for the edge dislocation stack that only applies to low angle grain boundaries but high angle grain boundaries have more complex defect structures we can no longer simply call them dislocations but they nonetheless are still defects that i believe in, in fact other people have shown through modeling they still couple to stress so the complex defects of a grain boundary will themselves couple to stress independent of the elasticity that exists on either side of the grain boundary those are two reasonable explanations we're actually in involved in a study right now in a collaboration with Georgia Tech where we think we're going to be able to distinguish which one of the two is dominant. Uh, but for now, I think it's still mostly, you know, a point of controversy. Uh, just a follow up question to that, Praveen, is that right? Uh, the, sure. the, so the, the nucleation site uh, where the grains decide to grow and then you get slip and persistent slip bands and the rest of it, is, is that a local region of roughness or is it a local region mm -hmm. in which the grains happen to find it easy to grow mm -hmm. well you know certainly roughness would probably play a role if it was present hopefully our samples were smooth enough that we weren't inducing that uh but that's always a concern of course uh, i will say you know the, the latter portion of your question i think is very reasonable which is if you look at the grains that did grow you'll notice that mm -hmm. typically they all have the same orientation. They were all green in that electron backscatter diffraction map that we have. The, the large grains tend to be a preferred orientation. And we look at when we look at that preferred orientation, uh, for example, in the context of a Thompson tetrahedron, we can think about which slip systems were active in that particular grain. And actually it turns out that that particular orientation is such that uh maximum schmidt factors operating on three separate slip systems so in other words it's sort of the easiest deformable orientation uh so i think the preferred orientations that do grow are the the, the grains that choose to grow are the ones that happen to be of an orientation of very easy slip so so you're still invoking plasticity before the grain growth i i and that's you know I, that's purely uh my own maybe i'm i'm still wanting okay. to think that there's still a dislocation plasticity source here that there's still some small amount of dislocation activity that's sort of triggering the whole process i don't know if that's i don't have deep evidence for that i just sort of i will, that's will, the picture in my mind will, will that also be consistent with your uh you know the md simulations where actually we saw that the largest grain actually started to grow first grow first that's right. Well, I mean, in, in grain growth literature, in traditional thermal grain growth, the biggest grains are also the ones that grow, grow the fastest. So, yeah, that's sort of an expectation from other arguments as well. But you're right, exactly. It supports my dislocation plasticity argument, which is the grain, the biggest grain in the population is already predisposed to more dislocation activity and it becomes a catch 22. It just feeds itself. So, uh, Sundar, uh, would you like to go ahead? Um, uh, sure. Maybe um, briefly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have so many questions. I, yeah, I, I know. I so just feel uncomfortable. Maybe, you know. Uh, maybe you can choose uh, the choose the best <laughs> two or the, the top okay. two. Okay. Uh, yeah, the 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 top two would be you know um, the the, uh, the grain growth pictures uh, Brad were obtained uh, in uh, bending. 
reverse bending. Uh, would you see a different picture if you were to do it in tension tension, for example? Yeah, we, we also did it in tension tension, and yes, we do see the same thing. In fact, some of the pictures I showed were also tension tension. You're right, the first picture I show was bending, but later on, and I, we've published several pictures of basically the same thing in tension tension. OK, and um, the, about the additives that um, uh, right. enhance the fatigue properties, um, what is the proportion of those additives? Uh, I was just wondering whether there was just enough of them to influence the properties through their own properties. You are asking a great question. Uh, we, in the case that I showed you here, we were adding 10% of solute. Uh, but that's yeah. not a magic number. That's sort of arbitrary. And uh, in more recent work, we've been investigating what the optimal level is. And we actually believe that uh, you get most of the benefit, even at like one or two or three percent solute, that we were probably hitting the system a little too hard with the, the solute. Uh, and that you, in fact, mm -hmm. You may not have much extra benefit by adding 10% solute. Now, it no, of course, no. will depend on the system. But uh, that's cer certainly another question that is valuable, and we're we're looking into that now. Okay. Um, I also had a critical comment. It's in the chat box. If you have the time, you can have a look at it. Okay. All right. I'll try to look. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we can move to Jaya. Now, Jaya, uh, just you, please, I know that you also have many questions. Please choose the top two or top one. Yeah, I'll just go with one. Uh, the Does the grain orientation or the grain boundary type uh, matter in these fatigue crack growth, uh, rather grain growth versus fatigue crack experiments? And whether cyclic loading is essential as well, like is it if you hold it at constant stress, would this mm. still happen? So, yeah. So, two good questions. Absolutely, grain orientation and grain boundary character are critical to all of the microstructural evolution that I showed you there. And, and that's where, you know, I, I just had a single slide that had several citations. We've published a dozen or more papers on the details of grain boundary crystallography uh, and the effects that it has on the mobility of grain boundaries, how that crystallography, how the grain boundary defect state evolves as the boundary migrates. There's a lot of beautiful detail in the metallurgy of grain boundaries and the crystallography of grain boundaries and their defect state and how that causes really dramatically modifies their effect. To put this in context, uh, if you simulate through atomistic simulations, and you can predict the mobility of any particular grain boundary configuration. And in, in a study where people have varied the grain boundary character across a wide range of characters, uh, studying like 400 or more grain boundaries, they see that the mobility of each individual grain boundary can vary by orders of magnitude, depending on its character alone, keeping everything else constant. So that is a very crucial element to this, this picture that I didn't really have a chance to mention. Now you had a second question and I've already lost it. Yeah, I said uh, if constant stress would uh, drive uh, grain growth or is it cyclic loading? Right, right. Yeah, um, so both can drive grain growth. There's been reports of both driving grain growth in the past. We focused on cyclic loading. It, it's interesting in this particular material, platinum, cyclic loading seems to induce grain growth quite readily, but mo uh, monotonic loading, we haven't seen much evidence of it. But other people in, for example, aluminum, people tend to report a lot of grain growth under monotonic loading, but I don't know of many studies that have shown it under cyclic loading. So the explanation for that is beyond me right now. But uh, I think people have certainly seen in Grain growth induced mechanically, both from monotonic and cyclic loading. Thank you so much, uh, and thanks, Raveen. Yeah. Sure. Ank Ankur, uh, I think some of your questions have been answered. Can you choose one? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, for your nice talk. Uh, just one, uh, two questions probably here. That is there a kind of a dynamic recrystallization happening? So do you assume that there is some kind of a heat? Uh, local heat which is produced during plasticity in some of those grains or the larger grains if suppose they are there and the next yeah. one is, is the crack front having or losing some kind of a crystallinity so usually 
in in situ kind of a situation, there might be a possibility that at the crack front there is amorphization or something happening. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so you know, for both answers, I think I'll point to the simulation side of things. Uh, although I think experimentally this is supported as well, but on the simulations, we can clearly show that this is not a thermal process. Uh, this is not a recrystallization driven by a thermal. Um, you can ask the question under fatigue loading, high cycle fatigue loading, do you are you heating it up? And uh, you know, back of the envelope calculations and whatever observations we can make suggest that this is not, if it's heating up at all, it's a few tens of degrees Celsius maximum, and that's being generous. Um, it's not enough to trigger thermally driven recrystallization. Um, the orientation, again, the orientation of the grains that have grown suggest a mechanical cause. These are not the grains that necessarily would be expected from traditional recrystallization. These have very particular orientations with a mechanical explanation behind them. So again, that's that's why it's important to distinguish this. I, it, there's otherwise quite a lot of similarity to dynamic recrystallization. Don't get me wrong, and I have to be very careful when I write about this to make sure that I don't discount the kind of similarities that exist. There's a, there are close an, uh, analogies there, but I don't think they're the same mechanism. Now, again, I've uh, you've asked a second question, and I got so into your first question that I forgot the second. So it was about that. Is there a loss loss of uh, crystallinity at the front of the uh, track? Right. We haven't seen that in neither the simulations nor in the experiments. Uh, have we seen any direct evidence of loss of crystallinity? Uh, when we switch over to diffraction mode, we don't find any amorphous rings or anything. So uh, it's it's always a possibility to be wary of when you've got so much energy in the system, but we haven't seen any evidence. All right, thank you, thank you, Brad. Yeah. So, uh, Brad, would you have a few more minutes, or this is yep. all? The time. Oh yeah, okay. it's it's a uh, it's going to be breakfast time in a half hour, but I got a few more minutes. <laughs> sure. So, Sibayan, uh, I, I think some part of this question has been answered by Brad, but yeah, uh, uh, if you if you like, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. Yes. Uh, so it's it's wonderful presentation. Uh, yeah, Thanks. this uh, question is in continuation with what Jaya asked, but a little more. So I was wondering that uh, your crack propagation and crack healing, does it relate some extent to the boundary structure in the sense that do you see uh, where the crack is getting healed or getting the crack propagation is getting slower? Is it a CSL boundary or not? Uh -huh. Oh boy, there's... I think there's no simple answer to what you're saying. Undoubtedly, the low CSL boundaries are a very important part of the overall discussion on the microstructural evolution. And in fact, when I, when I saw the crack healing, I pointed out that it was a, a twin boundary that was undergoing the migration. Now, I, I wanna point out, because I did read the comment uh, from Sunder earlier, I've associated the cold welding process here with the boundary migration of that twin boundary, but to his point, it does boundary migration doesn't need to be part of the recipe. Uh, we think that residual stresses alone, local stresses, could cause the crack closure and induce crack healing. So while in this particular case, we think that grain boundary migration was contributing, uh, you don't necessarily even need grain boundary migration. Uh, indeed, the residual stresses alone might be relevant. But to come back to your question on the role of C low CSL boundaries, yes, in this particular case, the mobile boundary was a twin boundary. But uh, you know, to add a, another layer of fidelity to this point, if it was a perfect twin boundary, it would actually be a zero mobility boundary. And it wouldn't move at all. And our simulations support that. In fact, we, in our nature paper, if you go into supplemental, you can read extensively about this. If we make the boundary a perfect twin boundary, the boundary doesn't move. And in the simulation, the crack doesn't heal. But if you make it a near sigma three twin boundary by inserting a few twinning dislocations on the grain boundary, those twinning dislocations couple to the stress, they migrate along the twin boundary, they cause the net motion of the twin boundary, and then the crack heals. 
That's what a simulation says. So it's not just that it was a low CSL boundary. It was a defected low CSL boundary that played the magic here according to our simulations. Oh, yeah, okay. But just one last question. Sure. But in your experiment, the TM experiment, where you actually see that uh, your crack is getting healed or at least its yes. propagation is slowed down. Uh, can you make an effort to check whether that, what is the nature of that boundary in your TM? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, so the crack actually, had, when it had slowed down before it healed, it was arresting and near a triple junction. I don't think that, I actually think my my superficial interpretation of what has what caused it to slow down what has more to do with the fact that it had deflected crystallographically it was of course following you know cleavage planes slip planes and things you know it was following the expected crystallographic orientation but it in when it got into that grain it deflected substantially into a deeply mode 2 deflection and i think so the the mode 2 driving force for crack propagation of course wasn't quite there and i think that's that has a lot to do with why it was slowing down in the first place but uh it's possible that the local configuration of grain boundaries were also contributing as well uh the and, the, and as i mentioned i mean one of those three grain boundaries was this sigma three twin Great boundary problem. so perhaps it was part of the recipe okay thank you yeah yep. thanks, no. thanks so we are reaching to the last question that i can see here uh what this is by uh, Kona Vira Ganesh. What is the reason behind the grain size increase with cyclic load of nickase? Well, so uh, again, it comes down to the idea that fatigue is somehow driving a grain boundary to migrate. And there are two mechanistic descriptions that we talked about today were uh, an elastic mismatch between the two grains that could create a preferential driving force. And of course, the fatigue loading is providing a uh, it's it's um, pounding the system with energy that allows it to overcome uh, um, energy barriers. So if the grain boundary is resting against an energy barrier, uh, but it wants to move because of the an elastic uh, mismatch, then the fatigue loading can just get it over that energy barrier. Uh, and then the second explanation that we talked about earlier was uh, plasticity based interpretation where you can think of the grain boundary as a stack of dislocations and we already know that the dislocations move to and fro under fatigue loading but perhaps they have a bias towards two and not so much of a bias for fro and as a result you get net dislocation collection this is all kind of the the basic arguments behind uh, cumulative plasticity under fatigue loading Thanks, thanks, Brad. Uh, thank you so much. Praveen, for... can I have the privilege of asking one last stupid question? Uh, it, oh, is, there a fre <laughs> yeah. is there a frequency dependence here? Because we are talking of dissipation, which is reflected in some atomic movement. Yes. So you would expect uh, some sort of a coupling between the frequency of the loading and the migration event or the dislocation glide event or whatever. Absolutely. I wish I could answer with evidence, but I think your expectation that there's a frequency dependence is perfectly reasonable. And I'll, you know, add one more layer to that. I would also expect it. There's a time dependence to this. So um, the amount of time that the crack is sitting around, as I say, some of this is that I think a lot of these uh, behaviors that we're talking about today have a a thermal component to them. So there's an energy barrier that's perhaps just not being surmounted, and it's the superimposed thermal contribution plus the mechanical contribution that allows you to overcome the energy barrier and, and migrate the grain boundary or heal the crack. So I think there's both perhaps a frequency dependence that's worthy worthy of study and, and a temperature dependence. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you might want to announce next week, next month's seminar. Yeah, so the next uh, seminar is on 23rd September. That is by Professor Helmi Atia from McGill University, Montreal, and that is going to be on machining induced changes in surface integrity and its impact on aerospace and structural integrity. So we will send the uh, circular in a uh, in couple of days and uh, we can again meet. So now uh, I think uh, Brad has been with us for almost uh, one hour, 50 minutes. <laughs> And uh, there is one last question there. There is local, there's some effect of local strain rate or something in that discussion. Would you like to take that or? or? Um, 
Yeah, the say, local yeah. strain rates, I don't think they're dramatically different. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think, uh, of course, local strain rates might be slightly different because the local stress states and strain states are slightly different. I, you know, all within an order of magnitude, I would suspect. So I don't think that's much, I don't think that's much of the part of the story in my cursory interpretation. Thank you all for great uh, questions. Would you like to conclude the, the talk or you'd like to conclude this uh, seminar? No, no, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, thank, thank you so much, Brad. As I said, you've you. been with us for one hour, 50 minutes almost, and uh, and that's also quite early in the morning on, on Saturday. So, so, so thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks very well, much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm impressed with your dedication to the profession. Uh, Saturday at 7, 8 p.m., you're here thinking about the profession, and I really appreciate that. And I've gotten, I think I had the best questions here I've ever had on a technical presentation. So I'm just going phenomenal. out to the bar now. But, uh. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I'll be joining you in about 12 hours. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Bye then. Yeah. Bye then. Bye.